Welcome to episode 44 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm interviewing John Suits. John is a writer, director, and producer. He's doing low-budget genre films and having a fair amount of success with them. We talk extensively about how he got his start and how he's maintained a career. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread the word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. And then just look for episode 44. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm talking with writer, director, producer, John Suits. Here is the interview. Welcome, John, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. So to start out, I wonder if you can give us a quick overview of your career and kind of how you got to being a producer and a director. So I, um, I, I went kind of the DIY model, I think, in a lot of ways, where um, I started making uh, movies when I was an undergrad. So I actually uh, made two amazingly awesome movies, features, while an undergrad um, that you will never find anywhere. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons from them about how not to make a movie. And uh, some things went well, some things didn't. And um, they're great learning experiences, and, and I think every failure is. So I did those, and then um, I, I was at time at school in Virginia, uh, and I moved out here for grad school at, at a school called uh, Cal Arts, and was was going there for film directing. And there, um, I was in the program with another student named Gabriel Cowan. So. Um, we met and immediately hit it off and found we had similar sensibilities. And we, uh, after our first year, I was, we were looking like, I was like, oh, I wanted to make another movie and uh, ended up making this film for basically like, you know, 20 grand uh, called Breathing Room. And the idea was like, like, we were like, okay, well, we know we should make something genre because we were told that's what you can sell. Um, and we were like, okay, it's gotta be one location, you know, no costume changes and just trying to find a way to, to make it as simplistic as possible. And we shot it in, I think, seven and a half days. So it was a pretty crazy shoot. And, and from when I started writing the screenplay to when we were shooting, I think was four weeks. So it was, uh, uh, um, a really interesting experience again. Mm -hmm. Um, and that movie, we ended up selling it, you know, worldwide and, it came out domestically through Anchor Bay. Um, and then from after that, for my thesis, I made a, uh, a, a film, which was a drama, kind of uh, a slice of life film about a, a family and gave, made a documentary. And, and everybody told us, you know, you can't make money on those, don't make them. And of course, since I was a film student, I know, knew better than all the professionals um, and did it anyway and like used uh, a bunch of my like student loan money and money I made for breathing room and so on and so forth. And uh, the movie got distributed, but it didn't, you know, uh, at all recoup and, and similar with the documentary. So then we're like, let's go back to this genre stuff and Gabe directed this film called Growth when we right as it graduated, um, which was kind of a sci-fi film. And our goal with that one was like, let's make it look big budget. So let's do everything we can to try to like, you know, we had 200 and some visual effects shots, aerial shots, underwater shots, um, you know, and it, and it went to the number one iTunes uh, rental in the horse section and, and also came out to Anchor Bay domestically. And that was a really good experience. And then um, I also got hired to direct a film right out of school called uh, Second Take, um, which was a dramedy. And again, great, great learning experience. And then I decided 
a gamer like I was like I, oh now I've done a movie that's let's that, that say you know in the five hundred thousand dollar range or a little under that um, you know now I want to like make a five million dollar movie so I spent a year uh, trying to get a five million dollar movie made and the whole time through the process thought oh I've, I've got it I've, I've, you know I just need this Louisiana tax incentive and this thing and that thing and oh this guy's gonna give us money and that guy's gonna give us money and and I had a uh, I was very confident that this was going to happen and basically ended up wasting a, a year on it. And in hindsight, looking back now, I'm like, I realized I was never anywhere close to getting the movie made. It just was like I was trying to believe and trying to, uh, uh, you know, get to that point. I think that was a really good lesson for me because it's also uh, something I learned that there's, um, there's a difference between someone saying, I'm going to give you money and someone giving you money. And that was an extremely valuable lesson uh, that I've since learned time and time again. And now uh, when someone says, I'm going to give you money, I go, OK, cool. And uh, keep trying to find other people that say that because it's, it's sort of you learn that the act of taking money from one bank account and putting it into another bank account is a lot more difficult than saying you're going to do that. Um, so uh, after that you know, film, after that experience, gave kind of the idea of like, why don't we just go back to this, this low budget filmmaking model where we know we can make the movies and we don't have to wait. And I was like, I was kind of defeated after that year. I was like, okay, let's do it. So that's when we kind of started this model. And that was about, I guess, three and a half, four years ago or so of, you know, trying to find really quality scripts or projects that we respond positively to and feel like actors will respond well to in festivals and really workshop them and get them in shape, and then to um, make those at a price point where they'll recoup. And that's kind of our our objective, so that we continue to have investors coming back to us. And um, it's been, you know, and so now Game and I have done 18 movies together, um, and we do about four or five a year. And you know, they they sort of range in all different genres from you know, drama to dramedies, some documentaries, but I think our sort of main focus within that context is on uh, more genre-specific films, you know, of things that are, uh, just because they have a, uh, you know, a better sort of uh, built-in recoupment model and that they are, are um, more sort of fiscally responsible to make. Mm -hmm. You know, let's t let's um, hit a couple of those points briefly. You mentioned Bre Breathing Room was the name of your, your first film out of school that you recouped your money on. Uh-huh. Yeah. OK. And what did you do? Just again, just briefly, what did you do to actually get that movie out there to find a good distributor? I, I mean, I'm a filmmaker myself and I've I've found so many distributors that promise the world and you hear and I hear so many horror stories. Yeah. You know, we're going to make your money back. No problem. You never see a dime. So yes. what did you do to find a distributor that actually bid pay you some money? So what what we did on that one and, and you know, the, the experience you're describing is the exact experience I had on, the, on my thesis film family for the drama where it was like, oh, we're going to make all this money. And, you know, they're always somehow in the red, you know, and that's kind of, I think, the more traditional, uh, uh, you know, uh, events that occur, I guess. Um, but on that one, what we basically did is we, we made the movie and then we uh, sent it out to, you know, this was kind of. Now I think we would just send Vimeo links, but at the time uh, we were sending letters, and this is in like 2007, and DVDs. You know, so we looked up like what all the you know best sales reps were, you know, or or whatever. We had some book, and it said here's sales rep companies for genre films. So we sent letters to 30 of them. And it was kind of a form letter where we put like, "Hi, blank." Uh, We'd really love for you to consider our film Breathing Room. We're a really big f fan of the work your company does. We, uh, really, you know, we enjoyed the films blank and blank, and think you know, that'd be like you know, Sharknado three and blah, you know, like yeah. just whatever film we could find that seemed to have the most activity on IMDb. Um, and so and not, most of them you had not seen. Oh yeah, not, not even heard of, much less not seen. Yes, I think all of them I had not seen, and most of them I had not heard of. So. It was a little bit of stretching the truth, I guess. Um, but so we sent out a bunch of letters and, um, you know, got, got, got some bites. And the company will ultimately end up going to, uh, who we've done now five movies with, with over the years, 
um, and who we really liked is this company called Imagination Worldwide. And at the time, there it was being run by a guy named Pierre David, and he had worked a lot with Roger Corman, and Gabe actually is, is uh, close friends with the Cormans. And so uh, he was talking to him, and he'd been like, I can't remember exactly what his job was, but he'd been a sort of high up at the Corman company, and he said to, to Gabe, just ask him about me, ask him about me. And so Gabe did, and they're like, yes, he's a trustworthy, great guy. And it's also run by I got this guy named Larry Goble, who's, who's currently running it. And so we kind of had someone we knew that could vouch for them. And I think that was a big asset. And that's kind of something, even now, whenever we're working with a, a sales rep or a distribution company, you know, we'll look at the other films they distributed and we'll call up the filmmakers and say, hey, did you, you know, see Overages? Did you, uh, did they, what did they promise? What did they deliver? Did you make your money back? You know, and kind of just do research because that's, really the only asset you have, you know, and it's um, uh, very important to do because the majority of the companies out there, kind of the process you go through is much similar to what you're just describing. Yeah, yeah. Um, good, good advice. Um, so let's talk about just briefly so people have some context. You mentioned about, you know, these genre films doing them at a price point where you can successfully recoup. Just roughly speaking, what are we talking about in terms of budget ranges for most of these genre movies? You know, I'd say, you know, keeping them under a million is a good, good place mm -hmm. to be. Um, you know, we've done a couple films over that. Um, but as a rule of thumb with how the market is, you know, and it changed pretty dramatically from 2007 to 2008 with the sort of uh, economy crashing and more, more so, though, with the DVD market crashing, you know, and blockbusters disappearing in Hollywood you know, videos disappearing, all that stuff. Once that happened, the value of a film kind of decreased quite a bit. So you had to find other ways to bring value to your film, which a lot of times is getting name actors and getting, um, you know, uh, having more high concepts things and, and, you know, making sure that you're kind of checking the right boxes. Because if we made Breathing Room today and try to distribute it, I think we'd uh, make... If we're lucky, we would have made half as much as we did in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, just because there's also, what's amazing is it's so much easier to make a film now. It's much more accessible, but that also means there's a lot more competition out there. So you have to find a way to distinguish yourself from the noise. Or, you know, and a lot of times that is one great way to do that is to, to be able to get, uh, you know, actors in it that are of a certain quality and, and uh name recognition because that also tells the distributor you didn't make it for twenty thousand dollars you know and that's kind of uh something they're looking for because they always want to know how much you paid in terms of so that they know how much they can pay kind of they're always fishing <laughs> yeah yeah so one of the things it's it's always funny that these independent genre films are actually probably the least talked about films you know, in sort of the film industry. And when people say independent films, they always think art house films, Sundance film, but really these genre films, there's tons of them being made in comparison to studio films and these Sundance films. And they actually are finding markets and making money. And I actually think for screenwriters, it's their best opportunity. I mean, the, the producers, the producers are much more willing to read a script from someone who's unrepresented and, and take a chance on somebody. So let's dig into some of these sort of um, genre films. You know, yeah. you've produced a bunch of them. So maybe we can just kind to talk about them for a minute sure. to, to start out where do these films end up typically showing up because if you i mean it's always eric roberts is like the prime example go to eric roberts imdb page and he's like he's like literally done 50 films just this year yes. but you won't see any of them and so where do these films show up that they actually are recouping their money right so so that's a, that's a great point it's a funny thing if you go to you know there's the film markets so basically with your strategy, you're either trying to sell at film markets or get into a festival and sell out of a festival and then subsequently through film markets. And, um, you know, a lot of those movies you're describing are, are like AFM titles, you know, like American Film Market. And it's a funny thing, you know, that it happens down in Santa Monica in November every year. And you go around there and there's all these sales reps and distribution companies and stuff. And they've got their kind of slate of posters and films on the wall. And you'll see like the same poster with Eric Roberts in every doorway, you know? So it's like, he's the guy that you pay him this much money and he'll do the movie. It's sort of unfortunate in some ways because I actually think he's a very talented actor, but there's certain actors that have that stigma and that, um, that 
also have a certain name recognition and value where they are like the, they're sort of the the AFM names that you just see their their face on every door in the you know in the lows or whatever. So um, you know, but for our films, you know, initially we were you know looking more at like the straight D to DVD type of stuff when we first started making movies. Um, the last few years, what we've been doing are kind of the day and date theatrical models or the limited theatrical models. So um, in that model, it, it comes out in a certain number of markets. Um, it's not a wide theatrical release. And, you know, that's kind of the big thing, too, of why I would suggest, obviously, if it's a, if you're a first time feature maker, I would suggest to make the film for the lowest amount you possibly can, like $20,000 because it's so important to recoup so that when you're going to make your next feature, you can say, my first feature made 150% of its budget. Whereas if you say, I made it for $200,000 and it made $20,000, that's not as appealing for your second feature. So uh, just that as a sort of, as a, as a setup, I would, I would strongly suggest for uh, filmmakers out there that are doing their first film, not to wait for that big budget thing for e or even for that $200,000 movie but just to try to go make it made if you're if you want to direct. Um, if you're a writer, I think making genre films or writing genre films is a very good idea because I think there is that danger where people see the big hits out of, out of Sundance, like the Fruitvale Stations or the Beasts of the Southern Wild and think, oh, I should write one of those and, and that's how I'm going to get my big break and it'll be the next Fruitvale Station. But for every one of those movies, there's honestly about 5,000, I would guess, that don't become the next Fruitvale Station. So it's just not a, uh, you know, if we're, if we're just talking purely statistically, the odds are not in your favor of that happening. It doesn't mean it won't, but um, we like to try to have, you know, higher odds and success. So, but with our films now, um, you know, and with all sort of, honestly, all independent films now that aren't getting a wide debt release, where the uh, focus is on recoupment is VOD. So the video on demand space is very healthy right now. So often you'll have a limited theatrical and let's say you make $40,000 and people go like, whoa, they really tanked, but you might make $40,000 and then on the video on demand make $2 million. You know, it's, it's that big of a discrepancy sometimes even more so um, because the model's not geared towards making money in theaters. It's geared towards the theatrical improving your video on demand numbers. Mm -hmm. So by getting you more reviews and getting it out there in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. So back to my question of where are these films showing, if you're, if you're visiting Spain, you know, next Christmas and you're in a hotel room, you might see the scribbler on video on demand. Right. And some of those markets, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but some of them will have a, you know, a limited theatrical component as well. Um, and then some of them, it will just be, yeah, on your, on your TV or on, you know, broadcast on some network or in your hotel room and, you know, all those sort of different or on their version of iTunes. Um, and it seems like because of what's happened to the, you know, the DVD market, also obviously like with Scribbler, it will be in Walmarts and in Best Buys and all that stuff and on Blu-ray. Um, and that's a, that's a chunk of it. But I, I think there's a more and more so with films, um, you know, and, and, and uh, the, 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 the focus, I think, for distributors has, has been a lot more VOD centric. Mm -hmm. So um, I, when people ask me, like, well, how much do screenwriters make on these types of films? I usually quote them two to three percent of the budget. And there's always minus contingency cost and bond costs and stuff. So a million dollar budget might only be seven hundred thousand dollars. But is that roughly what you would you would say you would give the same sort of numbers? Yes, I think that's about right. And it also varies uh, widely based on experience a lot of the times, because ultimately what Independent film space is obviously a, it's, a, it's a tough space in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of if you're trying to be a writer and director to, to make a full time living on it. A lot, a lot of times it takes a little bit of work, you know, um, and, uh, you know, so, for example, if we make one of your movies, you're going to make less than if Universal makes one of your movies. But the odds of the movie being made you know, our, our model is whatever we option we make. And that's kind of, I think, unique to us, or I'm sure there's other companies doing it, but it's not the traditional model. model. Usually we would option 30 things and see what sticks and make three, you know, but we more so spend the time to find the scripts that we feel very passionately about and then just develop those. So that's kind of a big 
sales point we have for for writers is it's true if you know universal options your movie you might make a hundred thousand dollars or more than that um and it financially will be mean a lot more to you but on the flip side the, the odds of that movie getting made are extremely sort of astronomically low whereas mm -hmm. if we option your movie i tell them i'm like i can't 100 percent guarantee it because there's always things that might come up but i'm telling you we will make your movie. And the funny thing in that is that, you know, if there's a lot of times when we're dealing with people that have other, uh, you know, have gotten other offers from different production companies, they're like, oh yeah, well that company says they're gonna make my movie too. I'm like, oh no, I know, but but seriously, we're gonna make your movie. They're like, yeah, that's what they said too. I'm like, but I mean it. Like, it's, so it's sort of hard until we've mm -hmm. done it and it's it's happened where they go, oh, you were gonna make my movie to, to have their uh, be a trust. Cause I think it's sort of that, you know, everybody, if, if you are optioning the script, you're going to tell the writer your plan is to make the movie because why else would you be optioning the script? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been tricky to try to navigate it and sort of tell them, uh, figure out the way to tell them that I, I mean it. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm curious what percentage, I mean, now you guys have a model. Are you pretty much able to break even or recoup pretty consistently with your films? Yes, and that's that's you know, that's been how we've been able to sustain our, our model and, and keep making movies is by that, is we have a good track record. Um, and, you know, it's it's a, you know, I, I think Gabe sort of used this line before, and, and, and I think it's true, but it's sort of a little known secret about the independent film space is that most, and maybe it's widely known, I don't know, but it's, uh, you know, most movies made in the space lose money. You know, I don't know what the percentage is, but... It's a very high percentage of films lose money, and it's because it's often first-time filmmakers or investors that have a false assumption of value. And thinking, because I spent $2 million, the movie's worth $2 million, and that's just not the reality. You know, I know of movies that were made for $20 million that sell for less than a $1 million. You know, so it's uh, it's very important to be cautious. And, and honestly, how we approach it in a lot of the ways are um, is we think about... You know, obviously, every movie you make, you want it to be great. You want it to be special, and we do our best to make it that. But sometimes, even if you have all the perfect elements and the best director, the best actors, the best writer, the best script, the best everything, sometimes there's not that magic spark when you shoot it, and it just turns out all right, or it's pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the way that we sort of look at it is to think, if we make this movie and it doesn't turn out the way we are hoping and expecting what's its value. And that's kind of how we work backwards. Um, rather than saying, we're going to make this movie, it's going to premiere at Sundance, it's going to be the next Paramount Activity, it's going to be the next, you know, Little Miss Sunshine, whatever it is, and be a huge deal, which is often more so the approach that we run into with sort of greener filmmakers is they're thinking it's going to be that thing and they plan that way. And that's where it's very dangerous because when that doesn't happen, you have angry investors or... You know, you've spent your family's money or, you know, all sorts of all sorts of things. So it's just important to be realistic and pragmatic and not uh, not expect it's going to have a huge premiere at a huge festival. But, but just to understand if it doesn't, what's it worth? And that's why, again, I suggest for first time filmmakers, make it for as little as possible, because then the risk is less and you get to have a trial run through everything, through the whole process and kind of go oh, okay, this is how it kind of works. And then the next time you're better suited, like how I was saying with, you know, I think uh, I, I've directed, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it's it's six movies maybe, um, maybe five or six movies, and, you know, two of those uh, were total disasters when I was an undergrad, and, and I, I hope that they've each one's gotten better than the last, because always when you go to the movie you did before, you're, like, feel embarrassed about it, so... Um, it's the same thing in writing a screenplay. I'm sure, that as, as, as you know, your, your listeners can hopefully relate to, where you write a screenplay, you think it's great, then you write your next screenplay, and you look at the last one you wrote, and you think it's crap. You know, so it's the same thing with making a film. Some people make their first film, and it's amazing, and it becomes the big success story, but you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes that you hopefully learn from, so it's best not to have a high risk when you're making those mistakes. 
Sure, sure. So let's talk about some of the films you've done. And, and um, you know, this is kind of maybe start with a general question, but where do you typically find screenplays for these four films that you're producing per, per year? So it's it's all different places. And it's, it's sort of like uh, there's a, a, a time in the year, like a couple month period where I, you know, go into Cocoon or Gabe and I do and just read for like two or three months to find the projects for the year. Um, and it comes from all places. Sometimes we're sent from agencies. Um, sometimes we're sent packaged projects from agencies uh, or managers. Uh, sometimes, you know, we'll put up Mandy posts um, and Craigslist. We don't do Craigslist posts as much anymore. And we've sort of slowed down the Mandy posts a little bit. For a long time, though, that's the only way we were finding scripts was Mandy posts where you get 300 submissions and read all, read all the log lines. And that's one thing I'd say, too, whenever you're submitting a script, don't think that whoever's reading it has the time of day to read it. Uh, Cause the thing that we run into is like, if the initial email we get is long, uh, I honestly, a lot of times won't read any of it because it feels daunting. I just want to know what's it about, you know, and then, okay, I want to read the first five pages and, you know, and having a, fir- uh, having your first 10 pages kick serious ass is more important than anything because it's often the case that you don't get by the first 10 pages. So just, being honest, you know, and so you have to really, uh, because what you're looking for is like, has the writer earned your trust? So first you read the log line and go, this could be cool. Then you read the synopsis and you either go, oh, never mind," or, oh, this could be cool. Then you start reading the script. And again, it's, it's, you might read the first, honestly, sometimes I'll read the first half of a page and go, no, this isn't a writer. I, I feel confident in. So, um, but it's just reading like crazy. I also will do things where I'll, you know, I use like this uh, service, the blacklist.com, you know, where they, it's pretty neat. It's kind of like a Netflix for screenplays. Uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, you guys are aware and being on the other side of it, I haven't used it as much lately because I felt a little bit uh, overwhelmed, but I have had times where I'll go on that site for a couple of weeks and just, you know, I'll read the coverage the scripts get. I'll read um, they'll see what the ratings are and then I'll sort of make a folder of scripts and try to get through as many of them as I can. I'll also look at old lists of things that have won competitions, whether it's like the Nichols or, you know, been, been in the semifinals or the finals. And I also last December, I think it was in November, I went through the entire blood list of all the, yeah. I don't know if you guys know about that, but it's the sort of genre version of the blacklist. And, yeah, yeah. um, you know, I've also gone on Script Shadow and seen what's gotten positive coverage, you know. So it's really, uh, for me, I just try to dive in and, and go all different routes. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't read blind submissions as much anymore. Um, I did when we were sort of a little bit newer as a company, but I'll, every day I'll get a few, you know, uh, scripts sent. And sometimes we'll read, end up reading the script, but I, I would say it's it's a low percentage, um, you know. But anyway, so that's kind of our, our process, and it's you know really just trying to find. I read so many scripts that I like. I'm like, oh, that's good, but I'm trying to find the one where I think this could be great, you know. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the uh, the way I've gone gone about it. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could just give our listeners some tips for writing these types of movies, you know, practical considerations for for um, locations and cast, you know, what specific genres are actually the best genres to write in budget levels. So let's start out with budget levels. You know, um, what should what should writers understand about these movies on the budget? I would say two things. One that, you know, well, it's it's, first off, it's, it's what's their intent. Are they trying to have a big spec studio sale or are they trying to get a movie made? Um, because based on that, it's a very different approach. If you're trying to do the big studio sale, try to write an Avengers, you know, or something that's a big action or whatever. Or, but, but more so than anything, it's, it's having a really solid hook, you know, like where I go, oh, that's cool. I want to check that out because that is how I read the script is if I see that the hook is really just, So having that super strong, amazing log line Seems so far because also the scripts I've read that have a more vague log line that don't don't hook me. Usually that's a symptom of a larger problem in the script. I found so starting with an amazing concept that's like oh my gosh I have to see that you know uh, is very important. And then in terms of uh, you know budget level, uh, the second thing I was going to say is I think there's a false assumption on what you can do low budget. 
like, for example, when we ever go to a studio and say, like, oh, most of our movies are under a million dollars, they go, oh, you just make found footage movies. And it's like, no, we don't. You know, um, we make things that look, uh, you know, we try to make them very polished and slick and well put together. And you can do that now with technology. So um, to think it has to be one location, you know, and, and that sort of thing, that's when you're doing an under $100,000 movie, I would say. Really focus on it being very economical. But when you get into the under a million range, uh, you know, I think you'd be very surprised <laughs> by what you can get. That mm -hmm. being said, don't write a movie in, you know, 2257 that the whole you know world is like, a future world with cars and things and think you're going to do it for a hundred thousand dollars, you know? Um, so, so I, I'd say it's a little bit of a, of a tricky territory that way. And then in terms of genre, you know, the thing that is uh, sort of hot at the moment or seems to have a greater value than the other is, is uh, sort of straight up horror a little bit is, um, you know, it's stuff you can sell, but it has a, 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 a sort of ceiling that's lower than if you're doing a sci-fi theme thing. Or obviously action, you know, if you're making an action movie, it has a much higher sales point. But then again, you have to make it for more. But if you have a smart sort of, you know, sci-fi, lo-fi, or, or lo-fi, sci-fi rather, or, um, you know, just a, a sort of elevated, well-put-together concept or hook, there, there just is a greater value to sci-fi than, than horror just because everybody's making their little low-budget horror movie. Um, so it helps you to stand out a little bit. And also, on top of that, um, you know, you want to have something that has strong characters um, and strong arcs. And that's kind of the way that when we're looking for sci-fi films, for us specifically, I'm looking often for films where the arcs and the drama and all that stuff is functioning and then seen it as a genre sort of backdrop. Like I'm not looking for a Saw movie or a torture porn or like Freddy versus Jason type of films. It's much more so films that are, in, that are genre so that they're sellable, but that also could function completely just as a drama in a lot of ways where the characters are rich, the dialogue solid. And, and that's also often the thing that I also run into a lot of times is, is, you know, that's probably the first telltale sign when I'm reading a script of that's something that I'm not going to enjoy it or that I stop as if the dialogue isn't singing. You know, if it's overly expositional or it feels a little bit on the nose or, you know, um, so that's kind of what I read first. When I go to a script, I'll read, you know, I'll, I'll skip the action and just read some of the dialogue. And then I go, OK, now I want to read more of the script or not based on that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's sort of a good red flag uh, and looking at things. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's kind of how uh, we look at it or, or, or approach it or think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go ahead and dig into the scribbler. You directed that one. Um, I guess it's going to be coming out here in the next couple weeks. Um, I watched it last weekend, a very stylized movie, very interesting stylized movie. And you definitely kept it in the one location you know the hotel or the, yeah. the the building but it definitely had a bigger feel i mean you moved around within that one location and got outside of that so you know well well done um Thank you. Th this was from a graphic novel so yep. i'm cu and it felt like that you, you captured that kind of um sin city vibe oh, little graphic novel um so i'm curious um you know how did you get involved with this project how did you find this screenplay so it was a it, it was an interesting process where it was actually we found the script almost from like a writing sample or something before we even knew about the graphic novel. Um, and so it's kind of a little bit backwards of what's I think more traditionally done. And, um, you know, so, but it was, it, it was again from, you know, what started the whole process was a submission from a Mandy post that eventually led me to finding the script that was written by Dan who wrote the graphic novel, but it did all start, it wasn't Dan that submitted the Mandy Post, but it, but it did start with a Mandy Post that led me to finding the scribbler, um, or led us rather gave gave an eye to. So, you know, it's it's um, it's one of those things where, and and when I read it immediately, it just felt different and unique and cool. And Dan, I thought was a, you know, he's an incredibly gifted writer, you know, um, and 
he's got a lot of very cool screenplays and he has a very sort of unique voice. And I think you could feel that right away. And that's what got me excited about it. And then sort of reading the graphic novel and seeing how uh, it, it was really cool to have that as a campaign piece to kind of use for, as you're talking about the visuals and the style, the kind of, uh, the goal was to kind of make it uh, feel like it's in a graphic novel world and consistent with the world that Dan had built and while well, kind of giving it a film noir vibe in some ways. And it's, you know, it obviously has some large tonal shifts throughout. And that was kind of uh, an interesting line to toe as in, you know, but that's kind of truer to graphic novels. And that's what we we're kind of trying to accomplish. But it's uh, not as commonly seen in film. So it was a lot, of, a lot of different challenges and things that, you know, I hadn't dealt with before, seen before. And that's what kind of made it feel exciting, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting in what you just said, I get a lot of writers coming with a screenplay and they feel like, gee, maybe I should turn my screenplay into a graphic novel and that will get some heat on my screenplay. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the graphic novel really didn't impact your liking this or not. In fact, you didn't even know that it was a graphic novel when you got invested in the script. Yeah, so th that's true. Is like I, it's, I saw something that said based on a graphic novel, but I didn't know about it. Um, you know, but I... I read it and I was really into it and read the graphic novel and then I just got obsessed, like reading all, each of them over and over again and studying them. And, um, you know, but I, I will say that having a graphic novel component, if it had, like the Scribbler was one that, you know, it, it was released through Image. It seemed like it was, you know, critically uh, well received. And so having something of that nature, um, you know, that, that definitely helps, you know, because you're trying to figure out, again, it's all about that hook and you're also trying to figure out how you can sell it to distributors and stuff like that and having the graphic novel and having, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a built in fan base to some degree. Uh, I would definitely say it helped, but it, but if it hadn't been a graphic novel, I think we, we still would have made it, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, cause yeah. I just really enjoyed the script. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about that. How successful of a graphic. I mean, I'm not, I don't read graphic novels, so I'm not really in that world. Um, cause that's what you always hear the built in audience. But I wonder, I mean, the way you're talking though, it sounds like you would have made this movie regardless. I mean, you're making your four movies a year. You like this script. Yeah. So, um, I'm just wondering how much that really helped. I guess my point is I get a lot of screenwriters and I just feel like they want to spend a lot of time writing a graphic novel and, and hoping that that is successful. And I'm not sure it's the best use of their time. I think I think writing more screenplays would be a better use of their time. I think that's a, I think that's a great, uh, uh, yes, a great plan of attack because I, the thing I found too, you know, is I think investing too much time in any one that now I'll caveat this comment, but because I think it's important to get your screenplay in shape and make sure it's functioning because otherwise no one's going to enjoy it. But I think spending 10 years on one script is way less productive than spending 10 years in writing, you know, a hundred scripts or something, because ultimately if you're fishing, you know, the more lines you cast out, the better chance you have of catching a fish. And, you know, rather than putting all your eggs in one basket, I think it's very important to sort of reach your tentacles out in every direction. And that just increases the odds of something sticking and of, of uh, you know, ultimately something happening in your career that way, because it's, it's just a, uh, it's very hard to with one project that if you just have that one thing to show, because sometimes too, I'll read a script for example and go, Oh, I really like this writer, but the script's not quite right for me. So then I email the writer. If I read it on the blacklist site or wherever, and I go, Hey, do you have anything else? And they're like, no, that's it. And that's, that's it. But as I like, here's four other scripts I've written then I'm like, Oh, awesome. You know, as, as an example, we're, we're uh, making another one of Dan's movies. Um, who wrote the script and he's written a ton of screenplays and you know i really enjoy all of them but some of them aren't right for what we're looking for at the moment because of the sort of specific um you know the 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 whether it's the genre or the the you know because it's very specific often what we're looking for at any one given time so there's been some i'll read screenplays that i think are amazing but i go you know what this isn't right for us at the moment but then i want to find what else that writer's done so it's good to have the next five ready to throw out. You know, here I've got all these different log lines. You know, there's this mm -hmm. uh, writer that we work with, son named Ryan Bonacco, who's extremely talented. I actually found him on the Blacklist website, just reading scripts on there. And what's cool with him, too, is that he not only is he insanely talented, 
but he also is extremely diligent and has like 15 screenplay ideas, you know, so, or screenplay, or he has tons of screenplays he's written. And then he has a whole another like thing of treatments and of, but he just works his ass off. It seems like at least, and, and has built up this, this large, you know, sort of library of content. And, and mm-hmm. I don't, I think that one helps you improve as a screenwriter and two helps you know, if something hits, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just want to touch on something you've said, and you've said it a couple of times, you know, this, you read something and it's not quite right for what you guys are trying to do. I wonder if you can just elaborate on that. You know, what is right? What is the kind of stuff that you see as being, you know, fitting into what is right for your right. company? Yeah, so it's and it's funny. It's a funny thing because it's like if you ask me right now, there's a different answer to if you ask me six months from now because it really does change a lot. Right now, what we're looking for are sort of elevated sci-fi um, at the moment. You know, we all and what does that mean, elevated sci-fi? Um, it's it's again similar to how I was saying not like a saw type of movie, but um, something that's more like we are what we are in the in the genre space or something or. That it's, for example, we just did this movie, 400 Days, we shot with uh, Brandon Routh and Dane Cook and Katie Lotz and Ben Feldman and Tom Cavanaugh and Grant Buller. Um, And we shot it, we built a whole spaceship set and everything like that. But it's kind of like, you know, these four aspiring astronauts going on a mission, a simulated mission that's to test the, the psychological effects of deep space travel for like, since we're, and this is actually happening in real life for the planned mission to Mars, which would be like 500 days if you went there and back. So it's kind of something like that. And then it, it, as it uh, as it goes, it's kind of like that. Uh, there's so many turns and, and mystery and great characters and, and arcs. And uh, it's very compelling and kind of a think piece in a lot of ways. Um, so that's more interesting than like, you know, transmorphers. Or transformers, rather. I just call it the asylum name. Transformers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, or something like that. So it's it's um, again finding something that has a cool hook or or unique element or something that makes it feel special. You know, and it's hard to define that, but it's one of those things that when you see it, you know it. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so if someone wants to watch the scribbler, what's the best way for them to find it? Uh, maybe you can just tell us the release dates and where it's going to be playing. Sure. So it comes out in theaters and on and on VOD. It's a day and date theatrical on uh, September nineteenth, so a week from tomorrow. Um, okay. And it's playing New York and LA the first weekend. I think it expands a little bit, and then in terms of you know, it'll be uh, on all all the VOD you know, platforms of, you know, Time Warner Cable and Comcast and DirecTV and iTunes. And um, it also then, um, I think a month afterwards, it comes out on Blu-ray. And, you know, again, we'll be in like Walmarts and Best Buys, um, you know, and and sort of so on and so forth. But so it, it kind of will be all over the place. But if you don't live in New York and L.A., then uh, the, the first weekend, I would say, please you know, rent it or buy it on, on the on VOD somewhere. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, well, what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Do you have a blog or a Twitter account or a website for your company? Uh, New Artist Alliance is a Twitter account. Gabe actually runs it. Uh, okay. I, I, I need to get a little more savvy with us. So I have Facebook. Um, but uh, I think it's the handles NAA Films, maybe, or at NAA Films. Uh, if Gabe was here, he could tell you exactly. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll get that from you sure. later and I'll put it in the show notes. So we have the exact yeah, thing, but he's, he's very active on that. So that's a good okay. way. And then we have a website that's naafilms.com and that'll kind of have updates. Um, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I think those are the best ways, but I, I do think Twitter is a good way. Uh, I just, I, I personally am not, uh, uh, totally up to date with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand. There's yeah. so many channels out there and you can't keep up with them all. So, yeah. um, well, John, you've been very generous with your time. I mean, this this has been a lot of great information. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's It's been very informative. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate you having me on and, and I'm glad or hope that some of the information is helpful. 
I'm going to be running another online class called How to Make the Opening Pages of Your Screenplay Awesome. This is probably my favorite class to teach. I actually learn a lot by preparing for these classes and reading the various scripts we're going to cover in them, so hopefully you'll learn a lot too. It goes without saying how important the opening pages are for your screenplay. If your opening pages don't hook the reader, there's very little chance that the reader will continue to read the script, so it really doesn't matter how great the rest of the script is. I'm going to be breaking down the opening pages of a bunch of great screenplays, including Natural Born Killer, Shawshank Redemption, Legally Bond, and a few others as well. This is the third class in the series, which is going to guide you through the entire screenwriting process from coming up with a marketable concept to outlining your script to actually writing your script and then to eventually marketing your script. If you miss the first two classes, no problem at all. I recorded them and have them put in I've put them in the SYS select form for you to listen to at your leisure. This class is going to be on Saturday, November 15th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. If you'd like to learn more about this class, go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. Also, if you're listening to this after the class has taken place, again, no problem. I will record this class and put it in the SYS select forum as well. In fact, all the classes that have been taught are recorded and are in the forum for SYS members to listen to. There's more than a dozen classes in there now. So to learn more about SYS select, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. In the next episode of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Julian Gilby. Julian is, a, Julian is a British writer and director. In the interview, Julian gives a detailed account of how he broke into the industry, and then we also talk about his latest film called Plastic. I think this is another, Jay, just to kind of recap um, today's episode, I think this is another great example of someone who just went out there and made things happen for himself. I mean, John tells the story of him making a film in, in film school and then getting out of film school and going back to that low budget genre film and making another film and, and, and slowly building from there. Also, it's worth noting, you can tell how practical John is. He's not looking to make art films. He's looking to make a living from filmmaking, and that means making genre films that have a market. I find a lot of new writers are really unrealistic about the sorts of careers they can actually have. A lot of people look at someone like Woody Allen and thinks that's a realistic career path. Go check out John on IMDb so you can get a, get a sense of the full scope of how many films he's done. I mean, he's building a solid career for himself. He's already done a bunch of films, and I'm quite sure he's going to do a bunch more films. Anyway, I've talked about this on the podcast before. These lower budget genre films like what John and his partner are making are a great way to break into the industry and get some real produced credits. This is essentially where all my credits in screenwriting have come from. Producers like John just want to find good scripts that they think they can turn into successful movies. So they're open to new writers. They don't care where the script comes from. They just want something that they can produce on a budget and that they feel is marketable. I've mentioned this in my screenwriting classes a few times, um, so maybe some of you have heard this, but check out Eric Roberts on IMDb Pro. It's Julia Roberts' um, actor brother, Eric Roberts. He's a famous and accomplished actor in his own right. Go take a look at him on IMDb Pro or just regular IMDb if you're not a member of IMDb Pro, you'll notice he's got literally dozens of film credits in this year alone. And really, think about what I just said. Eric Roberts has done dozens of films just in this year. And they're actually the source, they're exactly the sorts of films that John is talking about in the interview today, lower budget genre film. We're talking less than a million dollar budgets, most likely for most of these films. So look at Eric Roberts' credits and then drill down on some of these credits and, and you'll start to find producers who are making these sorts of genre films. Many of these producers will have contact information listed on IMDb Pro. So find some of these companies, drill down, collect their contact information and try and start contacting some of these producers. Also, there's the American Film Market, which is starting this week. It's in Santa Monica. It happens every year around this time of year. That's where these independent genre films are sold to the world. So many of these producers will be there. I did an episode with a writer named Andrew Cole who went to AFM and networked with these types of producers and found some success through it. And he gives out some tips about how to successfully navigate AFM. So have a look at that. It's in episode number 21. Again, this is a real practical tip of how you can actually get out there and start to meet producers exactly like John who are making these sorts of, of less than a million dollar genre films. 
So that's our episode. That's the show. Thanks for listening.